everyone, and welcome to virtual San Diego Comic Con. I am Talia Hirsch, and I'm moderating today what promises to be a really, really interesting conversation. The panel is the globalization of comics, um, and I'm joined by five really fantastic writers, thinkers, artists, people within the industry from all over the world. Um, given the nature of Zoom, I'll probably just call each of you um, to introduce yourselves. Um, and given the order of the screens on my computer, let's start with David. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm David Carlson. Uh, I uh, authored a book called uh, The Hunting Accident, which I collaborated, collaborated with an illustrator on. Um, it was, it's been my first foray into the graphic novel world, uh, so I'm a, really a newbie uh, at this, uh, but uh, the book has, uh, has taken on a life of its own outside of the United States, and so I guess that's uh, what I, I, I could talk about. Great, thank you. Um, and David, you are from Chicago, correct? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Uh, given that this is globalization, maybe kind of giving a shout out to where you are located would make sense. Um, Ken, you're up. Hi, so I'm Ken Nimura. I'm a cartoonist and illustrator, and I'm based in Tokyo at the moment. Uh, and uh, some of my works include like uh, the graphic novel Like a Giant that was published uh, in the States in 10 years ago, I think, uh, that I did with Joe Kelly. Uh, I've also done uh, a webcomic that's called Umami that uh, won an Eisner Award last year. Uh, and I've also collaborated with like publishers like DC Comics, Marvel, and, and others. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I have a book that's coming out in October, uh, a new one. So, well, you know, I'll probably talk about that later on. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Rob, why don't you say a little bit about yourself? I'm Rob Salkowitz in Seattle, where it's bright and early this morning. I am a writer and sayer of things about comics. I write for Forbes, Publishers Weekly, ICV2. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a book called Comic-Con in the Business of Pop Culture. And so now I'm the guy who wrote a book about Comic-Con. Um, and also uh, for the purposes of this conversation, I wrote a previous to that, I wrote a book called Young World Rising, which is about young entrepreneurs in emerging economies. And uh, for many years, I've been interested in what's going on in uh, Africa, South Asia, Latin America, um, broadly speaking in the creative economy, but certainly recently in the areas of uh, comics and animation. Awesome. Um, Asaf, you're up. Hi, uh, my name is Asaf Hanuka. I'm from Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, I'm a comic book writer and artist. Uh, I started with uh, doing collaboration with writer Edgar Carrot um, and with my twin brother, who is an illustrator. Uh, it's called Tomer Hanuka. And we did together a book with a writer named Boaz Lavi, uh, which was called The Divine. Um, and then I started publishing uh, short strips of autobiography under the name The Realist. Two collections has been published in, in the English language and in a few months the third collection will be released uh, and I won an Eisner for the first collection I think in 2016 maybe. Um, that's it. Okay and Emil uh, round us off. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't know. I ate a villager last night. No, I didn't really. I'm just kidding. Uh, I hate this part where I, I tell you about me, but, uh, I wrote a book and, uh, the book was called my favorite thing is monsters and, uh, it did very well. And, uh, which surprises me to this day because, uh, you know, truthfully I'd failed at everything I'd ever done prior to that. So, you know, I guess if you just keep trying, eventually you don't fail. Um, and uh, I've had the opportunity to see, uh, meet people and uh, experience comics all over the world as a result of that. So um, I think that helps me understand maybe a little more 
about the globalization of comics. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so yeah, basically these are all, you know, if you haven't guessed, um, we're from all over. Uh, I'm currently in New York City. Um, scheduling was an interesting process for those who are passingly curious about how this came to be. Um, but to start out, I really want to kind of explore what we mean by the globalization of comics. Um, it's the title of this panel, but the opening question really is to all the panelists here, when I say that phrase, or when you saw that phrase in, you know, initial emails and correspondence, what did that mean to you? What, what do you think about when we say comics are globalizing or globalized? Um, and I'll leave it open to whomever is ready to get this conversation going. Um, maybe I can start. So for me, the first time I saw the title of the panel, I thought, uh, I really don't have anything to say about it. it. Sounds something from the economic world or something about people who are doing business. And usually it's like not my thing. And I, I try not to focus on that side. I don't understand it very well. And also that my work today is so local. It's really about the everyday life and struggle of being in Tel Aviv and raising kids and having a family and, and with everything that's happening. So it's very, very local. But on the other side, I think from all the books I, I did, this one was the most translated. It was translated to 12 languages. And in a few years ago, I, I really like, I did, I don't know, for a few months, I just flew from country to country in each country that it was published. And I realized that the most local in, in a way somehow is really the most international. So if I talk about my struggle of uh, I don't know, paying mortgage and stuff like that, then somewhere someone in a country I never, I've never been in can recognize himself in it. So I don't know if, if that's the right answer, but this is what I feel about it. To pick up on that, that I think that's exactly right. One of the things when I started looking at this, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago with the advent of digital distribution, the idea that all of these people working locally suddenly are having their voices heard around the world is the most exciting thing. Um, you know, I was looking at, there was a collective comic done by street kids in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, that was distributed as a web comic in the early uh, 20 teens, like 2011 or something like that. It was translated in five or six languages. And these, these kids who had, you know, their, their stories to tell, you know, were, were being read all over, the, all over the place and their experiences were being universalized. Um, the artistic influences of uh, Asian style comics, European style comics, American comics are blending into these new and exciting styles. I just read a fantastic uh, work of graphics journalism produced by a, a graphic journalist from Central African Republic uh, er earlier this week. Um, so the, the opportunity for audiences all over the world to get these different points of view, these different artistic styles um, yes, there's stuff going on on the business side where, you know, like the industry is consolidating and all of that stuff. That is definitely a thing that's happening. But just from the point of view of creative expression, um, the chance for, for voices to get heard, I think, is the big, is the big headline. Interesting. I, I think I could just add for me, for the hunting accident, I think we had a little bit advantage of it's, it's a true Chicago story. But it involves the uh, the, the mafia uh, in Chicago. It was known as the uh, the outfit, and uh, so uh, I think that there is, you know, as I have traveled in my life internationally, and I tell people I'm from Chicago, I often get, you know, oh, bang bang, you know, Al Capone <laughs> is what they know. So I think we had a little bit of uh, that going for us. Yeah, I, I guess one of the things that made me think a little bit about this panel um, initially um, is one of the things that I do is I am uh, completing my doctorate at New York University. I teach a great books course. Um, and 
recently I started adding to the end of the syllabus, uh, Day Tripper by Gabrielle Moon and Fabio Ba. It's published by Virgo Comics, um, but the two are Brazilian. Um, it was, it's the only text from South America writ large in the class. Um, the concept of the great books tends to be very geographically specific. Um, and one of the things that I ended up learning, uh, NYU has a sizable international population, some of whom are from Brazil particularly. Um, and one student came up to me once and said, you know, there's coffee in every single issue of this comic. And that's very Brazilian. Brazilians care about their coffee. Um, and these are elements that speak to different people, can sometimes go way over our heads. But I think that that specificity to some degree um, is what resonates with us in a way. Um, specificity is what makes each of us unique and makes each of us human. Um, and so balancing that local and universal, you know, we, we, it's an interesting question that I have in my plan later on as well, and perhaps we'll get to it. But I, I think that the local is really part of what makes it universal in, in its own little way. Yeah, I would have to agree with that. Um, and I just, I probably don't have anything particularly smart to say about that, except that um, in, in agreement with uh, all of you, I, I think uh, telling a story, for me, telling a story about a kid who was basically me in, in many ways, um, <clears throat> it, it reaches people because everybody's been a kid. And that's, you know, that's a really accessible experience to have. Um, and, you know, talking about a time of change that the 60s were, which is where my story is set, is really resonant with people right now, because I think right now is a time of tremendous change too. And uh, people are experiencing that, but um, globalization, you know, I, I was listening to Rob and I just said to myself, I want to hear that. I want to read that story, whatever that is. Um, I think we're just, we're so lucky right now for this connection we have right now in this moment in time. I, I, I'm so, I'm so uh, rewarded by all of the things I see and uh, the talent that's out there all over the world. And, uh, you know, that's not an interesting thought, but uh, there you are. Sorry. I wanted to oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe add a different idea. Might, might not have anything to do with anything, but uh, anyway, I mean, the thing is like, I, I love, you know, I've been reading comics all my life. Uh, I love, you know, the, the physical object of, of the comic. And the thing about comics or for example, the reason why, well, why we are today like discussing let's say globalization in comics, uh, which in other media would be something that maybe we would have discussed like, I don't know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, to me, sometimes has to do with the physical objects itself. Uh, the fact that, you know, American comics, superhero comics or European comics or manga, they kind of develop separately and they've produced like different shaped books in a way you know like smaller books for manga bigger for french comics and stuff and so for example in tokyo if i go to a bookstore uh it's this stupid thing where all the bookshelves are made for the same uh size which is the japanese manga so if you're gonna find american or foreign comics they're gonna be in a different book bookshelf because they don't fit in the regular one and it's somehow like a problem that I've seen in other countries, like you go to France or you go to the States and you know, like maybe the books are uh, separated, sorted out by the country of origin, just because of the, the shape of the object they produce. And so on the one hand, like the good thing about like graphic novels appearing is that it's like a, let's say a format that uh, generates in a way like spontaneously in different areas of the world, uh, you know, like a black and white, self-contained big book mm. with maybe an older audience in, in, in mind. And so it's probably the, the first time where there is like one format that suddenly allows 
all the markets or lots of people from different places to like uh, pitch in or just like be part of the conversation. And that's why maybe it's taking longer than other media. Uh, I mean, if you compare comics to movies, like movies, you always screen them on a cinema and it's always the same film. If it, you, you know, the same if it's a Chinese or uh, an American or Lebanese comic, uh, sorry, movie. Uh, not the case for comics for a long time. And so uh, suddenly, probably, I don't know, comics like Persepolis, I, I guess, you know, in the ones that really have opened the market and shown that, you know, there were other uh, things out there and, you know, that the readers wanted something different. And this is the thing, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I was about to say, this is the thing that really uh, brought the United States, you know, into the global conversation is when the distribution model shifted from the comic store to the bookstore. I guarantee you that all of you guys on the call are selling 90% of your stuff in America on bookstore shelves, even though for many, many years, the way that most American comic fans got their, their comics was at the local comic book shop, which sells periodicals. So the shift, at, uh, just in the last two or three years, the more comics in America now are being sold through the bookstore channel than sold through the comic shop channel. That it took, you know, 50 years for that to happen, but it has happened now. And so, you know, when you walk into a bookstore, bookstore attracted different, broader demographic of readers in America who are seeing this stuff, who may have thought of comics before in one context as superheroes or stuff for kids or, you know, whatever, and are now seeing, um, the broad spectrum of things that are available from all of these different parts of the world. Europe has had that, Japan has had that, you know, for forever. And again, what you were saying about the format of the books, one of the things that got uh, manga, you know, that opened the bookstore channel for the United States in the late 1990s was that the uh, publisher in the US had the brilliant idea of publishing, um, you know, these comics as in the format that would fit on a bookstore shelf and the bookstores are like, oh, okay, we don't have to buy special furniture to store these, these, uh, these books. And then they observed that everybody was reading them and that, that kind of uh, set things going. So yeah, that, I think that's, a, that's sort of an understated um, uh, or an un, unexamined cause of one of the things that's, that's broadened the conversation, at least in America and opened us up to um, things that are going on in the rest of the world when that may not have been the case before. Yeah. Can I ask and, and Oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Don't no, no, Ken, go ahead. Just two two other things, and then we're we're done. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and then the other thing is like you know we have so we have the graphic novel. I think manga too is kind of like a format that you see pretty much all over the world, um, being published regularly. And and the other right now to me in my head would be web web comics, web tunes that you see online, and you know they're like vertical reading, and they're pretty much the same shape whether you're in Korea or elsewhere in the world. And so to me as a creator, um, how can I say, I, I, you know, I don't like rules, I don't like limits, but I kind of assume, I, I think that the fact that we found that a number of formats that are kind of like similar all over the world is the one thing that's really helping us being published in different countries and being read. Uh, so as much as I don't like uniformity, I'm happy for that on the other hand, because I'm able to suddenly read, you know, so, uh, stories from all, all over the world. But uh, let's say that in my head, my ideal uh, library, uh, well, bookstore, sorry, wouldn't be one where you have the book sorted by the country of origin, but with more like, I don't know, like alphabetical order or by subject, like, you know, like, I don't know, let's take, I don't know, reportage and have books from all over the world. Uh, but that's something that, it might still take some years maybe to develop and you know take shape. Neil, you have a question to ask? Is that acceptable? Absolutely, go for okay. it. I'm probably gonna get in trouble for asking this question, uh, I think, at San Diego Comic-Con. I know I'm gonna get in trouble, but I'm gonna do it anyway, all right? Because David understands this, we're from Chicago, we do these things. Um, what's the deal with the United States and comic and, and superheroes? Why have we held on to, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with superheroes. I love them personally. I grew up on them. I like them. But 
we, you know, Europe has been so much uh, faster at adopting the idea that stories matter and that the stories don't have to be about mutant creatures who can defeat criminals or villains. And, and I, I think there's something uniquely American about the love of superheroes. I, I'm, I could be wrong, but uh, here's the big question. Is there a correlation between like golden age uh, superheroes and some of the terrible things that have happened in the world? Do we still need them? That's another question I have. Does the world still need superheroes? Are there, are there more? Uh, what does everybody think about this, this graphic novels? What? What terrible things are you referring to? What? What terrible things are you referring to? Well, I mean, you know, you look at the need for superheroes through the Holocaust, you know, and I think Art Spiegelman has written a lot about this. And you, you know, I mean, when you're a human being and you're facing the horrors that the world can produce, I mean, it's really reassuring the idea that a superhero could be there or you could be a superhero to respond to these horrors. Or, I mean, I think that that's part of what's fueled the need for them. I, I, that's just my personal opinion. But what do you think? I think usually when, when, maybe it's a cultural thing, but when we stand and stare at something we can't understand, then let's say, a few years ago, maybe a few decades ago, religion was the answer. Religion was supposed to explain the unexplainable, like death and sorrow and cruelty. And maybe somehow in America, this superhero thing, I think it's not about comics really, it's about culture. It's about culture of power and moral and good and bad. These are all the basics of religions. And maybe Christianity, and maybe also Judaism, I'm not sure. But this, uh, it's sort of gods. They are God. I mean, they're in the sky doing their battles, uh, like some kind of modern mythology. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's like, this is one part of comics being globalized that everyone loves superheroes. I grew up on superheroes. I love the X-Men. I, I used to think about my life through X-Men characters. I was really into it when I was a kid. And, but at some point, I think there was a, a, a part of the creators who, who wanted to take the language and, and maybe take a step towards literature and personal expression. And, and when Rob, when you talked about the book, the bookstores opening the shelves for, for comics, I think it was that kind of comics. It was the comics that made a step towards literature and personal expression. And I think it's an interesting tension. I mean, obviously there are great works of art in the superhero genre also. Yeah. Um, but I think it has a different way of, it's not, it's not making the reader identify because it's, uh, it's about the local or the small, the, the, the struggle of a simple man or woman. It's really about uh, ideas of, of power and moral. I think there's also a uh, more, you know, like that, I think that that all flows as a, as a, sort of emotional uh, storytelling version of it. There's also a business story, which is that superheroes are controlled by corporations that are seeking to, like they are the perfect story platform for doing serialized entertainment, um, whether it's movies or streaming TV or something like that. If you're doing a comic in France or you know, almost anywhere in the world, you can't do anything without the consent of the creator. Um, you know, David, if your publisher wanted, you know, like Hunting Accident Part Two or an expanding uh, the Hunting Accident universe, and, the, and you didn't feel like doing it, they couldn't assign it to another writer and artist team and say, okay, well, we're gonna go in this direction. Whereas the, the, the fact that Disney and, and Warner and these guys control the Marvel and DC universes and have the ability to take those stories in the directions that they're the most commercially appealing into whatever media they want, I think has a lot to do with it. Um, the, the initial appeal of superheroes is exactly as you discussed. I mean, it was like, and also the fact that just in the 40s or the 30s and 40s, when you're printing four color on the cheapest possible paper, like big colorful costumes stand out on the page. It's just a good, it's just a, the right fit of the, the style for, the, for, for what you're doing. But um, yeah, these, in this day and age, I think a lot of it is being driven by the economic side of it as, as much as by the you know, sort of popular psych psychological desire to have those stories told. I, I would add too, I think that in the United States, there's um, 
the, the populism that is um, uh, that contributes to these uh, franchise, these superhero franchises, um, is also there's a sort of an anti-intellectualism embedded with that, um, and I, I think that this that the United States we're, we're like teenagers on the world stage. You know, we haven't really. Um, I've been able to uh, embrace uh, classic literature, the great poets of Western civilization, which is what much of what the hunting accident is about. Um, it, and so um, I think that works against trying to uh, get people to read in this country. Now, the interesting thing about uh, the French edition was the publisher there, it was their very first graphic novel that they um, wow. produced. And uh, they, but they uh, specialized in uh, noir type novels. So they knew their market, their readership, and they felt like this would fit. Uh, and then of course we, we won a bunch of awards and, and now the uh, Spanish publisher is, is taking the same approach. This is their first graphic novel that they're um, going to produce. And uh, so I think there's an openness and a maturity in this, certainly in the European markets. Uh, I'm not, I don't know about uh, Asian markets, but um, uh, there, to me, when you're dealing with um, sort of the, the canon of Western literature, uh, Europe is certainly the, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, I don't know if a homeland is the right word, but uh, it certainly doesn't reach across uh, uh, the ocean to the United States. And uh, we, we just don't have the same kind of um, uh, saturation in terms of education, maturity that's happening um, in uh, other parts that, that is, uh, ha has happened in other parts of the world. At, at the risk of going against um, for David and Rob's points, which I think are absolutely correct. Um, there's an element that, you know, as an educator, I've been thinking a little bit about superhero comics as well. Um, we tend to think a lot about uh, the graphic novels. And then every once in a while, someone's going to talk about a comic book. And the question then becomes, okay, what do these periodicals offer? Um, and I think that there's something to the longevity of a periodical. Um, so for example, the Hulk, um, Stan Lee spoke about, okay, so the Hulk is kind of a take on if you cross Jekyll and Hyde with Frankenstein's monster, you have the Hulk. Um, and there are certainly writers, artists, publishers, editors who have moved away from those origins. But when you have something that has lasted for 60 years, plus or minus a little bit years, um, <laughs> you don't have much choice but to explore every single nook and cranny of the character that you can, which means that for someone who's really looking at that dichotomy of the good and evil in every person, we've had 60 years to explore that at this point. Um, and to be able to fall back on that history of the Hulk, as well as Jekyll and Hyde, as well as whatever other iterations of Jekyll and Hyde have been within literary culture writ large, wherever you are from, um, there's something enriching to it. Now, does that mean when I open up a book of, you know, an issue of the Hulk, I will tap into that? No, you kind of need to know that background already. Um, but I think that part of what has kept superheroes around is just there's been that tradition and that tradition has existed for quite some time. And that allows a richness to jump off of to some degree. Um, and yes, I, I do agree with what David said that um, America is very much cutting edge, kind of looking fo forward looking, not as much reflective on the foundations. And I think that Rob's point about, it's really about the corporations and the industry that is comics pushing it forward. I think that those are both perhaps more correct than what I just said, 
Um, at the same time, there's an optimist in me that can't help but look at what we have there. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, the story structures or comics are ingenious. I don't want to. I don't want to uh, second guess that. There's a great book. Uh, Douglas Wolk, the critic, has a book coming out where he read every Marvel comic from like 1960 on, and his theory is gosh. that this is the longest novel ever written, and it's like a collaboration between hundreds of writers and artists and everything building this this tapestry of mythology, and that is absolutely compelling. And it is. I mean, it's like if you're into that you can start, you, you know, there's like a million points of entry, you can get into it and you can, you know, and, and, and as great as any standalone work of literature is, it's really hard to, um, you know, if what you're looking for is, is texture and infinite story possibilities, it's one of the great works ever done. And it's just, it's just astonishing. So, you know, if you look at it that way, then yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a lot going on with superheroes that is, uh, that's worth, uh, you know, they, they, they can capture our imagination on so many different levels. Um, if, if I may pivot just slightly, um, just I think that this is, this is a fascinating conversation, um, but to put the globalization question back into the picture, so to say, um, you know, we've had a fair amount of time at this point where writers, artists are coming in internationally and contributing and getting in conversation with each other. Um, and, you know, I wanna ask in general from each of your own unique perspectives, what are the implications of this more international community of comics creators, you know, writers, artists? Um, I want to tip my hat towards comic book fans being more international as well. How has this changed the industry? Um, and how has this changed, you know, from all ends of that industry? And once again, this is open to whomever would like to jump in first. I feel like I don't know enough about comics uh, mm -hmm. to answer that question. I hate to say that. That exposes me terribly, but it's true. I'm learning. I'm, I'm coming so late to the party. So somebody else here knows a lot more and can answer that question better. Well, I know probably less than Emil. I would say, I mean, this is, my, I'd never even read a graphic novel before I started working on The Hunting Accident. Uh, but I do think that um, this idea that there are uh, publishers that are starting to, uh, that are not traditional graphic novel publishers that are starting to look at uh, the marketplace, um, it, it speaks to um, the power of the graphic novel to take words and image and the interplay of words and image um, are um, a really powerful way to tell stories. Uh, there's a, Nick Susanis has a graphic novel called Unflattening. It's great. Absolutely my favorite graphic novel ever. And it, it goes into um, sort of how it changes the way we take in a uh, story by using the combination of word uh, or text and image. And, uh, so, and so hopefully there is going to be uh, more publishers that are starting to see it as a, as a maturing industry that um, will bring them profits, which is what they're after. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm certainly encouraged by, uh, uh, very encouraged by what has happened uh, with our book in particular uh, on the on the world stage versus um, the really limited audience of uh, the United States. Also, I think what Ken mentioned earlier about the web comics, like that's the real game changer. The growth of this platform is out of sight. So it's, you know, it starts with Webtoon in Korea. Um, there was, a, there's a company, an indigenous uh, American company called Tapas that just got acquired last week for $560 million, they were a startup. And this is the largest money deal since Disney bought Marvel in the comics business. Wow. The, reason that, the reason that they're putting this money into this platform is that the growth rates for, this, for these are 300, 400% per year, year over year. Every country in South Asia has their own, is funding their own Webtoon platform. So there's Webtoons from Vietnam, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from all of these places being funded partly by public-private government partnerships, 
Why? Because everybody's got a cell phone in their pocket and this is the way to get these stories. But the other revolutionary thing is that these platforms, particularly Webtoon, uh, relies on user-generated content. So people that are creating fan art, fan stories around these titles, posting them on the platform, the Webtoon is looking at those and they're saying, these people are getting a lot of fans. Let's bring them in and turn them into professionals and give them the support, give them the marketing to build that audience and start selling these stories serially. So people that are 16, 17 years old, a lot of women, by the way, that, that don't get the time of day coming into the you know, mainstream, you know, into the traditional comics industry are saying, screw that, I've already got an audience of millions that are reading my stuff here. And so it's, you know, it's opening up these, these avenues, um, a lot of the stuff that's going on in Africa and like in, in other parts of the world where cell phone penetration is like 90% now in a place like Ghana, you know, everybody's got a cell phone in their hand. So if you wanna put comics in front of people, it's a nightmare to distribute them um, you know, uh, physical copies, so easy to do it this way. So I think, you know, like if we look ahead toward the 2020s, that's where the future of the comics medium is, is going to be. And that's where the future audience is. That's fascinating. Can you say the name, what name that was again? The, what was uh, just bought? Of what, was, of, what was just bought? Oh, Tapas, T-A-P-A-S. Like yeah, yeah. snackable, snackable content, right? Got it. And uh, they, they just became the main course for a very large uh, Korean company that, that bought them and a fan fiction site called uh, uh, Radish, I believe, and it for like a billion dollars total. And they're pushing these companies together to create this like, you know, megaplex of international fan created yeah. comics. Amazing. This it, is amazing. It's incredibly amazing. Yeah. yeah. I have to say, I tried to read a few times comics on the cell phone. Maybe I'm too old. I'm not sure. Wrong. But uh, I think I found one which was great, which was like uh, someone's childhood. And then yeah, you see him grow up. And there was, they were using really in a smart way the fact that you like uh, scroll up all the time. So it's like it's, it's a different layout. There's a, some sort of movement that's happening. And it, there's a rhythm. I really think it's an interesting format. Maybe maybe it's the future. But uh, about globalization, I also think that um, it's, it really allows people like me who are doing niche content. So it's not mainstream. The numbers are modest. But I think without this globalization, I probably couldn't do it. And the fact that in every country that I visited and was able to publish, it was always the same kind of uh, it wasn't a big publisher. It was like this, I would say, medium size, and they had the adult section. And the fact that they have a few followers on the internet, that it's like, it's enough. It's enough to get a book out. And I think before internet and everything, I would probably would never do it because it was never enough to be like a classic mainstream uh, uh, creation. So I think that, you know, uh, I'm for the globalization. I guess like the good thing is that, I mean, if I think of in terms of like friends, let's say, is like you have more chances of making more friends all over the world, basically. So uh, as Asaf was saying, like, uh, you know, I won't pretend I would be able to be friends with everyone in each country I go to. But, you know, there are certainly a number of people that, you know, I can get along with in each country. So, you know, the hope there is that maybe, you know, the books I make, they they're able to reach you know the the, the readers the, the people they are intended for uh, and uh, as as I've said like if you're not one of those like huge sellers in one single market which is for example not the case for me uh, you know I can make a living out of uh, you know selling small bits in in lots of different countries and so in that sense goes the same for internet for sure but you know it's it's nice being able to go to different countries and meeting people you, you never met or you have very little in, in common and and finding that, you know, there are certain things that maybe um, you do share. I mean, I mean, not even about even my comic, but if it's that funny thing where if I meet somebody who likes, um, I don't know, like a song or a movie that I also like, uh, I instantly have a certain connection there uh, because I already share like something, you know, I, uh, even if it's like, or even if it's like they don't like it, but you know we share at least like what that one thing in common, and that's the one thing that I really like about 
um, as a creator about making comics uh, that you're putting out like an object out in the world and you know that's gonna make people react positively or negatively who cares but like uh, hopefully you're you're making a certain difference uh, just by putting it out and um, and personally hopefully you know that just means like I said like having a little bit more friends out there. Well, Emil, I know that doing Monsters gave you the opportunity to spend some time in France and, you know, do all sorts of cool things there. What was your experience in encountering the, the fans and how did they, was there any difference in the way that they were appreciating your work or like, how did, you know, you have a firsthand global perspective, I guess, from that. Well, uh, it was crazy. <laughs> I mean, it was nuts. Um, and I, I'm sure David could, he's gone, but I'm sure he could say the same. Um, I, I remember I had a signing at the gallery that, um, that uh, represents my work. And uh, the owner of the gallery lives across the street from the gallery. So I looked down on a rainy day thinking uh, that the gallery was about to open. And well, it was maybe it was an hour from opening. It was a very rainy day. And the line to get a signing that day was down the block. And it was people standing in the rain to do it with their books wrapped in plastic. And it was a lot of people. And it wasn't something that I could have imagined happening in the United States in that way at all. And it was frightening. And I ran out of the building and I got on a train and I left. No, I didn't really, but I wanted to. I really wanted to because I uh, have a certain aversion to crowds and to a whole bunch of people, which I do. And I, instead I took it on, but uh, it was uh, amazing and wonderful. And my experience was that everywhere, I, I mean, I was, it's a different culture because there I go into a restaurant and people actually recognize me. I mean, it was kind of like not something that would happen in the United States because the book had gotten so big there. But there's also a difference in the way that they, I mean, culturally, they live with art and in a way that we don't. They, they live with their history in a way that we don't. And yet they also have other things. And I will, I will balance this, not meaning to offend them in any way, but I have to say, they have a very different educational system than we do. There's not a lot of art education in our schools anymore, I think. I think that it's really diminished from when I was a kid. And, um, and they have more perhaps, but there's also a prevalent attitude in their educational system whereby they're very much discouraged from pursuing artistic uh, uh, pursuits. Or, they're, it's just, there's a matter of practicality about how they're educated. And I think if that were not the case for the French, they would be a, a nation just completely full of artists because they love art and they're brilliant. I mean, they're just really smart people, uh, especially visually, they really understand the visual. And uh, I think, I wish that would change, but I wish it would change in our country as well. And I wish it would change in the countries of the world. I think children are really being cheated out of their heritage, which is part of the reason I wrote the book because I was amazed at how many great works of art my daughter's friends didn't know of, um, that they had no idea that these things existed and they were literally a few miles away from them. I mean, the, one of the greatest museums in the world was a, was a few miles away from them and they'd never been there. And I said, well, this is, this is if you, I mean, I can't swear, but you know, it's effery. Let's just put it that way. It's utter effery that these children don't have their own heritage. And I think um, in, in France, there's something a little bit similar. And that is that there's a, a if people become more free all over the world, and I think this is what Rob was saying about the globalization with the web comics, when people are more free to be the creators they are, we're gonna have a better world. I mean, I don't know if, uh, if you know, the, the, the kind of war criminals who are running a lot of our countries, I'm not sure if they would be better people, but um, I think they would be if they were able to create. 
And I think a lot of them are creators actually that are thwarted or frustrated and they become, I mean, Hitler, you know, I mean, it's the kind of like, uh, I know some others, I know of others who wanted to be artists. They wanted to do something other than destroy. I think we have to change how we do education, which is why I was reading about you, Talia, and I was so happy with what you're doing for kids because it really matters. Uh, it matters that we change this world by being artists, by being strong, by being a tribe, and by refusing the destruction and always choosing the creation. The creation is our way out of this. You know, it really, really is. And we have it right here. It's right in our grasp. Uh, and we can lead the charge, you know, humbly as we will, and as frightened as we are, and as running out of that apartment to go somewhere else as we might have been, you know, we can lead the charge. We can do that. Okay, so that's it. That's all I've got. That, that, that's, you know, just nothing, you know, no big deal. Yeah. Um, no, I, that was amazing. Um, we are unfortunately basically out of time. I am both a little sad that we can't follow up on that, but really happy that we ended on that note as well. Um, so just with the few minutes that we have left, um, would anyone like to make note of things that anyone who has been watching this can either follow you on or with any books that are coming out that haven't been mentioned yet? Things that people who want to hear and see more of your thinking and doing can look for or at. I'll start. Uh, it's my work is called The Realist and it's coming out in English in uh, Boom, Arkea, Boom Studios. Um, and also The Realist on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, you know, all that jazz. I have a book coming out in October, I think, that's called Never Open It, that's being going to be published by Yen Press. Uh, and it's great. So hopefully, you know, go and take a look at it. I have a couple of books that I hope to be talking about this time next year. In the meantime, you can follow me at Rob Salk on Twitter. Um, that's where I post about the stuff that I write for Forbes and ICV2 and Publishers Weekly. Um, and I write uh, five or six times a month in those areas on all aspects of the comics industry and the business of popular culture. Yeah, um, and David, uh, just to quickly jump in for David, um, he had to leave a little bit early, um, but yeah, The Hunting Accident is out from first second um, and you should definitely feel free to read it. Um, it's a great book. Um, and this Blair. And isn't isn't his partner Landis Blair fabulous yes. artist as well? I, I love yes. her. And I was just uh, I'm blown away by them. Their their collaboration is fantastic. Uh, yeah, for myself, I will say, uh, who the hell knows? I don't know. I don't know what's coming. I I mean, uh, uh, I guess when this airs, I'll have an exhibit up or I'll be part of an exhibit at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago which I think is a really kind of a great thing. A lot of great comics artists in it, all Chicago people, uh, you know, Chris Ware, Linda Berry, uh, a bunch of others, me, you know, and uh, yeah. Wonderful. Well, in general, I'm really looking forward to what's next um, in the interim. Thank you for this conversation. It was absolutely fascinating. I enjoyed it very much. And to everyone at home, um, happy Comic-Con. Enjoy. Thanks for tuning in and take care. Thank you. Thank you.